Hey everybody, Nick Tenbrook here again with producer Val Garay, and we're going to talk about his uh, encounter with uh, the great Elton John. So uh, tell me how that all happened. Sir Elton John. Sir Elton John. Yeah. Dang it. Yeah. Um, I've been working at the Sound Factory for a number of years, and we were contracted through Motown to do a bunch of uh, all the tracking for Motown because Motown had moved here from Detroit and didn't have a studio at the time. They eventually built a studio, uh, Mo West is I think of what it was called, but at this point in time they didn't have a studio. So we were contracted to cut all the tracks for Motown. And one of the arrangers who worked for Motown a lot was Gene Page. Right, can we back up though? So then. Parenthetically, what other Motan acts did you happen to end up working on while that uh, contract was happening? I worked on uh, pretty much everything that Freddie Perrin and Fonce Mizell did, which were the corporation. So it was Jackson 5. Uh, and, and it was interesting because if we cut a track written by Holland Dozier Holland, they'd have Diane Ross sing on it, they'd have Marvin Gaye sing on it, they'd have Stevie Wonder sing on it. They pretty much passed it around till they... The, Barry Gordy felt that the song fit the singer. Yeah. Um, and there's also stories that all those guys got charged for that track, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. But meanwhile, you were recording all these tracks with all these yeah. Uh, people. Yeah. Right? I was doing that all the time. I mean, I worked on the Marvin Gaye Trouble Man record. Uh, I worked on... Um, Jackson 5. What was that around the time of ABC? ABC and yeah. I Want You Back. Okay. Both of those. Yeah. I think I did the tracks to both of those records. Yeah. In any case, so Gene was a big Sound Factory fan because he's been sitting in there. We'd do 10 to 1, 2 to 5, four days a week. Sure. You know. Yes. And it was... Union you know, hours. Like. Union hours. And it was all the same guys. Gene Page was the conductor and the arranger. It was uh, either uh, Gene Pello or Ed Green or... Uh, John Guerin and right. uh, you know the keyboard was uh, what's the guy from the, the jazz group you know Victor Feldman maybe no 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 the the bass player was uh, was really a sax player he's the one oh Wilton Felder Wilton Felder was the bass player <laughs> and uh, Joe Sample was Joe the Sample keyboards. right the guys from the jazz. Bobby Hall was the percussionist yeah, the and jazz messenger yeah so it was that kind of group of people yeah. that played on everything and so um, Elton had cut this song uh, in England and he wanted to put a string horn arrangement on it so Gene chose the sound factory for us to do it he brought it in uh, I think Gus Dudgeon was the producer on that and we did the strings and horns on Philadelphia Freedom, which was the biggest hit single of Elton's career. Right, and and really one of the biggest string and horn cuts of his yeah. too, right? Yeah, you know those weren't just in, buried in the background. That oh, was no. a big part of no, it. No, no, and and the flute thing, which was uh, who was the guy playing flute? He's also a sax player, mm. a big studio guy. Um, yeah. Ernie Watts. Ernie Watts, just what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, <laughs> we did the whole thing, mixed it, came out, huge hit. Elton sort of became a fan of the Sound Factory, so he said to Dave Hassinger, would you let me premiere my next album at the Sound Factory? Okay. And the next album was Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. So, I'll never forget this as long as I live. So the the... Studio A in front of the control room, we set up with chairs because it had a big pair of 604Es on the wall so that the press could hear the, the album. Yeah. And they're all sitting there facing that wall, which right. is facing towards Selma Avenue. Yep. And there must have been, I don't know, 75 major press people. But before anybody else came, a Brinks truck came with the two track. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Which I thought was yeah, pretty cute. far out. Yeah. Yeah. Really, br a Brinks truck. Yeah. <laughs> and two Brinks armed guards bring in the quarter inch tape copy. <coughs> you know? That's wild. Yeah.
Uh -huh. So we played it for the whole world that yeah. day, and it was a huge success. Everybody loved it. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that was part of my career right, with Elton right. John. So what year was that? Do you remember? What year? Um, nineteen seventy-eight or seventy-nine. Yeah. Something like that, but it's easy to figure out. Yeah, okay. Let's see. All right. We're going to look it up. Yeah. On the World Wide Internet. Do you want to know when the Captain Fantastic album came out? Yeah. That was um, May 19, 1975. 75? Yeah. Okay, so then this was 1974 then. Right. Interesting. Okay. So, see when Philadelphia Freedom came out. Pretty interesting. Yeah, so middle 70s. It wasn't the late 70s then. Yeah. No, it was 1975. Yeah, yeah so yeah. 1974 is when we cut it. Right. Or the end so, of 74. Was that still before the mixer had pan pots on it? No, that was the API. So and when did that happen? 74, 73. Not a lot before that, though. No, not a lot, but right. it was the first API on the West Coast. Right, but that was the first time people were, before that there weren't pan pots on no, the No, there was four buttons. Yeah. You could punch left, far left, mid left, center. Right, so that was really something when there's pan pots on yeah. the console. Yeah, completely. Things we just take for granted now. Yeah, right. You know, that's funny. A lot of things you take for granted. Now. No kidding, but that's definitely one of them. Yeah. All right, that's excellent, Val. Thanks a lot. See you okay. next time. <laughs>